welcome back everyone to wake up with cheddar on this Wednesday morning. It's been well reported that throughout the pandemic, people have been fleeing major cities like New York and San Francisco, all to move to less populated areas. Now, a key beneficiary of the shift has been the real estate market. So how has the coronavirus changed the real estate industry and what trends are we going to see stick around in 2021? Joining us now is Tim Rood, Managing Director at Citus AMC. Uh, Tim, good to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. So what stood out to you the most in the real estate market in 2020? Uh, given this is bacon day, I got to tell you, it is sizzling hot. Um, anyway, sorry, you walked right into that one. I couldn't help it. <laughs> But hey, so I think you need a baseline before you jump into the COVID impact. If you look at, you know, kind of your baseline for where we were before COVID, going into 2020, you had a blistering hot real estate market, right? You had incredible demand. You had a demographic tailwind as millennials were coming of age. Uh, you had low interest rates. Supply was low, but manageable. You, you fast forward to, you know, March, and obviously, you know, you, you hit a wall. Uh, construction stopped. People who were listing their homes pulled their homes off the market. Folks who were thinking about listing said, no way, it's too uncertain. I don't know what's going to happen health-wise, financially, and otherwise. So everything hit a wall. Um, subsequent to that, COVID has really had three impacts uh, on the housing market. One, it's increased demand, to your point. Folks are leaving the cities. It's mostly anecdotally, but there's enough evidence that you, know, you can say it's a trend. They're leaving the cities for bigger space, more space, safer space. Then you've got interest rates. So part of the federal response to COVID was a heavy duty monetary response that drove interest rates down a full percent. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, sorry. Well, keep, keep going. I was just oh, gonna say, minute. I was just gonna say those interest rates not gonna change whatsoever for many years as a result of that. So do you think that this trend will continue as a result of that, Tim? Well, I think the one other thing I would say is the, the, the opposite side of that, that trade is that supply actually dropped about 35%, right? So, so that's the market you're dealing with. Interest rates are certainly gonna stay low. They might tick up. I mean, you're at 30 year fixed money at two and a half, two and three quarters percent. Might go as high as three and a quarter next year, but certainly not prohibitive. Um, so I think it's certainly gonna stay affordable, but you gotta remember while lower interest rates certainly helps from the affordability standpoint, that 1% lower rate that we got in 2020 makes basically your house 13% more affordable, or you can buy 13% more house, which is darn good because you're having appreciation rates at like a percent a month. So, I mean, that's not sustainable, but you should still have a very healthy market in 2021. Absolutely. And one of the other trends we saw, Tim, was a lot of people leaving big cities, New York, San Francisco, fleeing to the suburbs. We saw Austin, Texas, really a hot spot for a lot of people to move. Are we expecting that to continue in 2021, or are we expecting a lot of those people to come back to these giant, these giant uh, urban centers, given the fact that we are going to have a vaccine distributed widely next year? It really depends on the course of the of the virus. So if, if enough people get vaccinated, if the vaccines are successful, we don't see any other strains of this, then I would imagine uh, folks are gonna get back to some sort of normalcy and come back to the cities or be less inclined to leave. I mean, the problem with leaving the city is, you know, if the vaccines work or if the virus goes away, then I'm probably gonna have to go back to work at some point. I can't telecommute for the rest of my life. So I don't wanna jeopardize my job. Um, and the other side of that is also, I think in 2020, roughly 80, 85 percent of the people that moved still stayed in that general area. They might have come out of the city and gone to the suburbs or the exurbs, but not radically different enough, but not radical. Uh, Tim, how much do you feel like people were maybe thinking about going to the suburbs anyway? And if anything, the coronavirus just accelerated everybody wanting to make those decisions, given the fact that it was a good real estate market, interest rates were low, but they were already thinking about doing it and the coronavirus just accelerated that. I think it's spot on, Baker. I mean, one of the things is you have millennials, you know, move to the cities as basically as they were getting started. That was their first household. They're going to rent. They wanted to stay close to work. They wanted walkable amenities, transit oriented communities, all those conveniences but it's hard to raise a family in a 500 square foot studio apartment. So, you know, they're they were already inclined to go to the suburbs. They might actually rent in the suburbs, but they ended up actually owning in the suburbs. So I think you're right. It did just basically pull demand forward. But what it created though was opportunities for those further out areas, the exurbs that were pretty much written off. Uh, because now again, folks can telecommute. Um, it's more affordable. There's such demand for 
suburbs right now that you know you need to look for those further out spots just to again to find something important. Absolutely. What uh, Tim trends do you think you'll we'll see in 2021? And I ask that because is there going to be an inventory left in 2021 for people to be able to still snatch up a lot of property next year? Yeah, so this is kind of the wild card. If you think about it, one of the things that's uh, contributing to the supply deficit is that you have these foreclosure moratoriums, so you can't foreclose on properties. I think that expires now at the end of January. You have properties that people who can't make their payments for some COVID reason related reason, they have, are, they're afforded forbearance. So they don't actually have to make any payments for a total of 12 months. It's gonna be curious to see how many of those properties end up on the market um, and how many of these sellers that were reluctant to sell, you know, during the beginning of COVID, you know, now are basically unclenching and taking advantage of this, you know, hot seller's market and jumping into it. The other side of that, of course, are builders. Builders have, haven't been this confident in 15 years for the longest time, they couldn't find anything to build. They couldn't find anything for people to buy because they were so expensive um, in the uh, you know suburban areas and the uh, cities. So now they're looking at, well, hey, this might be a, the perfect storm. I got more demand because there's not enough supply of existing homes and people are willing to go further out. So that's money. Absolutely. And by the way, we saw agents had to get really creative because of the pandemic to sell a lot of these houses. Tim, do you do you see any sort of lasting trends that COVID has, has done to the market that you see are going to stick around next year? Well, look, I mean, the, some of the things that facilitated all the sale activity has been all of the online services. So you can you can do the research for a host for a house online, which a lot of folks did before. But now you can take that research take it to a virtual tour. You can apply for a mortgage. Heck, you can close on a mortgage and the house all virtually. I don't think that's gonna go away. I think that you might be getting to a point where, you know, it makes people uncomfortable that the pace of these things, because they're so technology enabled, might be moving so fast that people will get anxious, you know? I don't know that I need only 10 days to buy and close on a house. I mean, there's what if there's buyer's remorse or anything like that, or you find out something's wrong with it, that if you spent more time you know, with an inspector or an appraiser, you probably would have made a different decision. So I think the technology is still there, the speed is there, and then you're gonna see from the origination side, you know, you've had all of this refinance demand, record uh, mortgage activity, and now it's gonna contract because you, everybody who could refinance has refinanced, and then you're gonna see these lenders have to deal with overcapacity. And I can imagine that they're gonna to need to do things to bring down that capacity, right size, it gets some equilibrium between capacity and demand and lean into outsourced service providers like Citus AMC. Uh, really great points all around. Tim Rude, Managing Director at Citus AMC. Good to have you here, Tim. Thanks so much for getting up early with us this morning. And speaking of the past.